So unfortunately, we're going to take a little bit of a dark turn here, but I think it's an important thing to talk about. So this is actually uh, from a paper that I published uh, with my team in May in the journal Social Science and Medicine. Uh, the comments I'm going to make are my comments and don't necessarily reflect everybody else. All right, so I'm going to start talking about a couple of definitions about discrimination, and then I'm going to start talking about the causal chain between discrimination and psychological distress, and then we'll go, we'll define psychological distress, and then we'll talk about the causal uh, chain between psychological distress and pain, and then I'm going to define chronic pain. You all get to do this with me. I'll give a little tiny bit of the complicated statistical analysis that I did. And then we'll, we'll look at the national estimates of the effect of discrimination on chronic pain, and then I'll give some implications for Christians. So let's take a test of daily discrimination. All right, this is a, a valid uh, uh, measure. So uh, how often on a day-to-day -day basis do you experience each of the following types of discrimination because of race, ethnicity, gender, age, religion, physical appearance, sexual orientation, or other characteristics. And you can have four answers for each of these. One is never, which you'll give yourself a zero. Rarely is one. Sometimes is two, and often is three. And then we're going to roll them all up to get a final score. So one, you're threatened or harassed. Two, you're called names or insulted. Three, people act as if they think uh, you are not as good as they are. People act as if they think you are dishonest. People act as if they are afraid of you. Uh, people act as if they think you are not smart. You receive poorer service uh, than other people at restaurants or stores. You are treated with less respect than other people, or you're treated with less courtesy than other people. All right, so count those all up. So we have data on this. This comes from the National Survey of Midlife Development in the United States, and this is a survey of thousands of people, and we followed them over 20 years. We, we uh, asked them questions at one point, 10 years later, and then another 10 years later. So in this uh, group, we had a range of 0 to 27. The average person had a, had a, uh, a three, about a three and a half score. 41 percent, about two-fifths of people, didn't have any experience with this. 10% had a score of 9 or higher, and 2% had a score of 14 or higher. All right, so let's take it up a notch. Let's take a test of lifetime discrimination. So in each of the following, indicate how many times in your life you have been discriminated against because of race, ethnicity, gender, age, religion, physical appearance, sexual orientation, or other characteristics. Well, I'm going to switch that a little bit. Just, just just count yourself as a one if you've experienced the category or not. So the difference between this list and the previous list is the previous list was hits you get on a day-to-day -day basis about your character, really. This is about things that can affect you socially or economically. These are harder hits. So you were discouraged by a teacher or advisor from seeking higher education. You were denied a scholarship. You were not hired for a job. You were not given a job promotion. You were fired. You were prevented from renting or buying a home in the neighborhood you wanted. You were prevented from remaining in a neighborhood because neighbors made your life so uncomfortable. You were hassled by the police. You were denied a bank loan. You were denied or provided inferior medical care. Or you were denied or provided inferior service by a plumber, car mechanic, or other service provider. Most folks have experienced this at least once on average, but actually two-thirds of folks haven't experienced it at all. About one in seven, 16 percent have experienced one of these. About one in five, 22 percent have two, experienced two or more of these. And about uh, one in 50 or two percent score five or more categories. All right. Now we're going to talk about psychological distress a little bit. This is also a valid uh, and reliable measure. Um, so we're going to ask you about the past 30 days, how often did you feel, and give a couple, we'll give a set of uh, adjectives, and square yourself as four if it was all the time, three most of the time, two some of the time, one a little of the time, and zero for none of the time. So were you, did you feel nervous? Did you feel hopeless? Restless or fidgety? 
Did you feel so depressed nothing could cheer you up? That everything was an effort or worthless? All right, this is, on average, people will score about two and a half on this. Scores that are about between five and 12 indicate that you do have significant psychological distress, moderate psychological distress, where you don't have serious mental problem, but you could benefit from some therapy. If you have a score of uh, 13 or above, you have serious mental illness, probably. About 20% of people score the moderate to severe categories, a fair number of people. All right. Now, the idea that discrimination might cause psychological distress is pretty intuitive, right? Treated badly, you feel bad. And there's a large literature that finds an association between discrimination and psychological distress, but there's also human experimental literature. And this shows that it's the pervasiveness of discrimination, how many contexts it occurs, how frequently it occurs, that's fundamental to whether it's gonna cause you psychological harm or not. So the bottom line, there's this dose response relationship going on. Um, now we get to the more controversial part, the idea that psychological distress by itself might result in pain. Now there's a recent biopsychosocial review of the literature on pain and emotion, and it finds that uh, psychological distress plays a pretty large role in the experience of pain. You can have tissue damage or disease process that can precede pain, but you can also have psychological distress. They may, might precede pain. So here's how kind of how it works. It's no longer a black box. So think about anxiety. We could technically define that as negative affect based on apprehension about anticipated future threats that have uncertain outcomes. So basically you're worrying about bad stuff happening. And because of that, you get hypervigilant. You know, you're, you're really concerned about things. And that can actually cause neurobiological changes that result, result in what's called hyperalgesia or, or a higher sensitivity to pain. And this is a, an adaptive response because you want to know when something might happen to you so you can protect yourself. And there actually is a, a, a large set of, of human studies. I'm going to back this up. So human studies have found that it, if we experimentally induce anxiety in people in the form of pain-relevant information, that can cause an increased sensitivity to pain. And this, these are, this is the worst set of studies, and not in terms of the quality. Human experimental studies show that if we increase uh, your uh, anxiety, this can produce pain just by itself. Just making you more anxious. If we get it high enough, it can produce pain. All right, so I wasn't the physician on this, on this um, project, but these are the, the biochemical pathways that are involved in citations in the paper. So we've talked about how discrimination can cause psychological distress. We talked about how psychological distress can result in pain. How about chronic pain? Chronic pain is something that persists, go on for weeks, can go on for months, go on for years. Um, and sometimes, of course, it'll happen because you have disease processes going on. But sometimes there's actually, they can't find anything wrong with you. There's, there's just pain, right? 85% of low back pain is not specific. They, they can't find any reason for it. I have a separate paper on that. But this is, but it's still real pain, nonetheless. It's real pain, it's really in your body. About a third of adults suffer from chronic pain. 20% um, of these folks have mild pain where it's annoying, but it doesn't interfere with your activities of daily living, you know, getting dressed and feeding yourself and getting it out of chair and stuff like that. Half of folks have moderate levels of pain where it is starting to interfere with your activities of daily living. You know, it hurts to comb your hair or to get up out of a chair and it, it gets in your way. And about 30% of these folks are, have serious limitations in terms of activities of daily living. They're in a lot of pain. So let's take a test of pain. Uh, because pain can occur in different parts of your body, we need to have some kind of common denominator so we can compare pain as happening in different parts of your body. So one way this is done is from the brief pain inventory. 
So we have five categories. You can score yourself from zero to 10. Zero is no interference. 10 is completely inter or a very high levels of interference. So the past week, how much did your pain interfere with sleep or your mood or your enjoyment or your relationship with others or just general activity? You can divide by five. And, and in our study, any, any positive number on this is considered having chronic pain. So it's chronic pain that actually interferes with your life. It's not just irritating. All right, so next question comes is, how in the world am I going to get causal evidence from observational data? Well, the economists in the room will, the economists in the room will understand this. Um, there's a, in statistics, there's a technique called instrumental variables that allows us to estimate a causal relationship it, it roughly will mimic a randomized controlled trial. There's very strict criteria to use it appropriately, and we satisfy that criteria in this study. So this is a, actually a causal effect. It's a, we call it technically a local average treatment effect where the local part is changes in discrimination. All right, so here's the bottom line. So here's uh, the dose-response relationship. So on the vertical axis, you have the probability of experiencing chronic pain. On the horizontal axis, we have discrimination. This is either lifetime discrimination or daily. The solid bar line there is uh, lifetime discrimination, and the dashed line is daily discrimination. And those are additive. So if you, you, uh, if you have a high score on daily discrimination, you would add that to whatever score you have on lifetime discrimination. Now, it, even if you max out on both these scales, you end up at about 0.26. So you're a quarter more likely to have pain. So it doesn't seem like it's that high, but there's other factors that are involved. Personality factors play a big role in this. The, uh, the big five personality construct, one of those is uh, called neuroticism, which is your sensitivity to negative events. And some people are very sensitive to negative events. So they'll be more likely to have this. And then probably the biggest issue is what's your pre-existing level of psychological distress? If you have, my brother's a psychiatrist. And he says, everyone has, he calls the five finger rule. There's five areas of your life, right? And if one area is bad, you can probably can withstand some stress. Another one's down, you know, it, it gets tougher and tougher and tougher. And then, you know, some people, you see them flip out at, at very small things. They probably have a lot of other things going on in their life. So the bottom line on how, how people are affected, we estimate that 4.1 million U.S. adults these are only people age 40 and over, because that's our data, have chronic pain because of their experience of discrimination, just because of discrimination. So, so it's a lot of people. So as, as uh, Christians, um, what are the implications? We talk about the old saw, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, that's usually true, but it's not always true. So we need to be fairly careful with how we treat people. You just, you just don't know if you're gonna be the person that pushes them over the, uh, pushes them over the edge. And uh, to, from a, a more uh, biblical perspective, St. Peter uh, taught in his second letter to honor everybody. So what's honor? It's to regard with great respect. And that's the opposite of discrimination, right? It's the opposite of discrimination. What's the basis of honor? The foundational book in the Bible, Genesis, whether you see it as a symbolic book or if you, whether you see it as history, the, the, the principle is still there. Everyone's made in the image of God. It's repeated in the New Testament as well. So that's really the, 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 uh, the religious, the Christian solution for this. You need to honor people. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an optional thing. 